Hi, welcome to this week's episode hosted by Gray and Mark Larson, Dunn's Health and Fitness, and Mark Elm of Leeds Beckett University, where we take training theory and science onto the gym floor. Yes. Hey up everybody, welcome back. Here we are, it's episode 22 of the Yorkshire Fitness Podcast. Nailed it in one. I am getting quite good at this introduction thing now. I have messed up for a while. You nearly got it wrong. You thought I just told you. You stuttered on 22. You stuttered on 22. Yeah, 22. So, yeah, you've nailed it, great. Cool, thanks. Uh, yeah, right, welcome Thank back. You really. I, hope you're, um, I hope you're enjoying your podcast recently. There have been some quite good topics. We've, we've quite enjoyed lately having a couple of guests on. Um, we kind of enjoy it. Obviously, throws a bit of a new dimension in for us all, doesn't it? It gives us some us some else to think about leading up to it, rather than just kind of thinking, "Oh, what's hot on the? What have people been asking us from a gym point of view?" Um, so we've gone down that route again today. So we've brought another guest in as old mate Johnny, and we've I suppose we've all known Johnny while you probably the longest, Elm. Probably. How long is it? Yeah. How long has it been? Would you say? Ooh, fifteen years, John. Do you think? Uh. Yeah. It was about 2009, 2010. Something you know, like that, yeah. So about 12, 12 I don't years. I didn't put it in my calendar that day, so I'm going to say yeah. 10 to 15 years. That, that, that area, yeah. Right. Back yeah. when we all probably had a bit more air. Uh, oh, right, right, I, I just turned my head upside down. Um, I just yeah. turned my head upside down now. Um, so on that note, so we'll introduce you. So, well, this is John Eaton. Um, so John's had a massive history in the world of health and fitness, haven't you, John? Um bodybuilding, personal training, strength and conditioning. So it's just a, you know, a really good guest for us to have on and we can have a real good chat about everything, you know, what, what you've experienced through your life. So welcome, John. I'll pass on to you. you. We can have a little chat straight off. Yeah, so are you going to ask me a question or is that... Well, no, no, no. What Grace should have done then was instead of telling his... You, you, you telling his life story, he's like, John, yep. tell us about you. All right, so yeah, all right, John, you can go a little bit deeper because it's not just a case of, oh yeah, we're a bodybuilder, then I were a PT, and then I've done strength and conditioning, is it? Go a little bit deeper. Tell us where it all started. Yeah. Where did your love for health and fitness start? Uh, well, I'm in my third or fourth career now, like some of you guys are possibly as well. So I worked in insurance straight from school for 10 years. Then I worked as a fitness instructor for two years and then I got into S&C quite early, uh, Cast Tigers. So I, I was only a qualified fitness instructor two years when I got that job. And I was just helping out at Cast Tigers back then with the academy and the first team job came up. So they offered me that for a year. Uh, it was a little bit too soon for me, to be honest. So I got released and I went on to Gateshead Thunder, uh, Morley Rugby Union, just flitted around the rugby league scene until I ended up at Batley Bulldogs where I stayed for about six, I think I did six years, and then I moved on to Castor a year with the academy, and then I went back and did another couple of seasons at Batley. And now I'm at Wakey Trinity Ladies, for my sins, doing the S&C. Uh, personal training-wise, after I finished at Castor the first time, I qualified then as a personal trainer. So back in oh, well, the early 2000s. Know, sorry, so when, when did you qualify as, as, when did you first get into your S&C work then, Cass initially, about mid-20s, were you? Yeah, so when I left my insurance job, I'd have been 26. So I started maybe like about 28 when I started doing the S&C side of it and PT, 28, 29. My son's 22 now and he was, uh, he was born when I was working at Cast Tigers because Stuart Raper gave me a day off. I had one day off when my son was born. Very and then I was back in, yeah, it was kind. That was my paternity leave was a day. <laughs> and then I was back in for training the day after with the lads. So that's how I know how long ago it was when I was at CAS 22 years. Right. So you got into, so you, you kind of went, did you, so you did more S&C first before you got into your personal training then? Yeah, amazingly. Because when I did my bodybuilding career and I got back into S&C, a lot of people were reluctant to give me work because they said, oh, he's a bodybuilder. He'll just have everyone doing bodybuilding. And they didn't know that, I actually worked in s &C before I did bodybuilding because I didn't, I didn't compete in bodybuilding until I was 33. So that was kind of afterwards. 
right. already. Well, I was going to ask you about your bodybuilding. So, you, so like, what what got you into bodybuilding, and and how did it go? Yeah, so I was like a lot of us, you know, when I was a kid, massively into Arnold Schwarzenegger films, uh, Sylvester Stallone, Rocky films. So I'd always been into that, that side of it. But as we'll get on to when you look at my five lessons, the one thing that I never thought was that important was nutrition. So I thought, if I train hard, I can eat and drink what I like. So that's what I did. Uh, so then when I was a PT, some years later, one of my female clients said that she'd heard about this natural bodybuilding because I never wanted to take drugs, which is another thing that put me off bodybuilding. Because I thought, I'm not going to take steroids, so there's no point. And then she told me about the natural bodybuilding where everyone's drug tested. And she was going to do a Miss Figure competition that year. So I said, well, I'll tell you what, we'll do it as, together as a project. I'll enter the men's, you enter the women's, and we'll go through the journey together. And then I did it for eight years. So she, I think she only did it for like one year. And then she ticked that book off her bucket list. And I, I ended up doing it for eight, eight years. So that was how I got into the bodybuilding. And you ended up doing all right in bodybuilding, mate, didn't you? Do you want to tell, yeah. tell us a little bit how yeah. and what you did, where you competed? So I went my first, the first competition was like a novice. It was the Northern Novices in the BMBF in Manchester. So my, my goal was not come last. So I think there was 12 in my group or something like that. So I thought, don't come last. Don't come last. Am I boring you, Graham? No, mate. Thought, thought he was going. Uh, yeah, don't come last. And I came second and qualified for the British finals in my first ever competition. So that was a shock that I actually was quite good at it. Uh, I won the British novices that year. Then the year after, I went into the wet, wet categories. And I came third. And then the year after that, 2006, I won my weight class in the British which qualified me to go to the Worlds in Italy, where I came second. And then it was just went on and on. And then in 2010, I actually won the Worlds in uh, Barcelona. And then I won the Worlds again in 2011 in New York as a drug-free athlete. And then I retired. So I'd kind of, I said I would do it until I was 40. And then I'd hang me budgie smugglers up, which is what I did. And then you faked Tam. Yeah, no, I still use fake time. I live in Wakefield. That's that's a pretty. So you were the world champion. I was the world champion twice. Twice. Uh, Two time world champion. Two time world champion. Two time. Two time world champion in a sport that I didn't start doing until I was thirty three. That's pretty impressive. That's really good going that. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. So that's when I tell my students because I I had couple of well as you know as we talked about my injuries when I was playing rugby I had to stop playing rugby because of injuries if I hadn't I got injured I'd have probably carried on playing rugby and I was a very poor to average rugby player I'd have probably carried on playing at my old rugby club and you know just played amateur with my mates and as luck had it I got injured which I didn't see at the time as luck but then that got me into the weights more which then ultimately got me into bodybuilding so Every cloud has a silver lining. I'm not usually that sort of person. I'm more every uh, silver lining has a cloud. But in that cert circumstance, I turned an injury into a positive. Very good. Um, like, can we, while you're on that subject, can we just go? Can we just mention that a little bit? Because I know you, you've kind of you've spoke quite a lot about mental health, haven't you? I've heard you've done interviews and stuff, haven't you? You've kind of you're, you're quite yeah. aware of it. You're quite good at putting it out there. Did the bodybuilding side? Because I, to me, bodybuilding, you have got to restrict so much kind of enjoyment, drink, food, foods that you love. Does that have an effect, do you think, on you? If you did that for eight years, were you pretty constant on that journey for eight years? You didn't have any, like, kind of... Right. It's not like where you can have a season in, oh, yeah, I'll drop in, I'll, I'll, I'll train up for this. Well, if you're constantly doing it for eight years... Yeah, well, as Mark one because he was teaching me at the time when I was competing, so I didn't... I wasn't one of those bodybuilders that it was 12 months out of the year that I lived that life. That's why I'd, it was a sport to me. It wasn't my life. Right. I didn't walk around in my weightlifting shoes with a bum bag on and walk around town in a vest. Uh, I did it as a sport. So I had a competition in mind. I'd set me, once I got to know what I was doing after the first couple of years, 
I knew how long it took me to get into that shape. I knew what sort of things I had to eat, what sort of things I didn't have to eat. Uh, and I'd get ready. So it's about four months, 16 weeks. It usually took me 12 weeks for the qualifiers and then another four weeks for the British or the world. So 16 weeks at a time where I'd restrict. And then I'd go mad for a month or two where I'd have Harry Bows for breakfast and things like that. And then I'd get another competition in mind and I'd start again. So I wasn't 12 months out of the year, but it was four months at a time. Right. So other, other side of that, oh, sorry, John. Go I'm gonna, just going to say other side of that, that is a little bit like um, when people go and they try and restrict that when they are trying to lose weight and, you know, when we have clients and they go and they try and hit it hard for like a spell, let's say, right, but this next eight weeks, I'm going to nail it and I'm going to do this, that and other. But then, like you just said then, wheels completely fall yeah. off. You've, you've, because you've restricted yourself that much in one go. You, I mean, yours is to extreme when you're yeah. doing bodybuilding. So when you've got to get to percentage body fat, you had to get to. But that is where people go wrong, isn't it? You know, like from another side of it, like it's not it is, physically yeah. that good for it because you're craving everything that you've given up. So, like, I totally get that. And we it's, see that, like, on a different level, but we see that with, with clients, which you'll have seen yourself. I'm well, pretty now, sure. Now, this time of year is like classic, like June. Holidays, holidays, oh, holidays, yeah. holidays. Eight weeks well, and, the, and then go binge on holiday, come back, yeah. put everything back on, feel back to square one instead of being a little bit more consistent and just doing things gradual and changing changing behaviours. But like you said, bodybuilding isn't a, isn't a behaviour, it's not a, a lifestyle change, is it? It's not to keep to yourself to that kind of percentage body fat. It's in it's in an option really, is it? I wouldn't have thought. Well, I was, I wasn't a big fan of bulking and cutting. So some of my friends and uh, fellow competitors would go bulk in the off season and then they'd shift four, four or five stone on a prep. Whereas I tried to stay within a stone. Yeah. This was my goal. I always wanted to be a, walking around most of the year. I wanted to walk around about a stone over what I would be competing at. So then I knew within 12 weeks, I could easily lose a stone without. This is, 2009 was different. I, I actually became borderline anorexic and it's not, I'm not trivializing it. I, I, I know now what anorexics feel like in 2009 because in bodybuilding and shredded glutes is kind of a gold standard for a lot of people to, to have your backside looking like a walnut. And I'd never achieved that. So I thought, right, this is what I'm going for this year. And in fact, my head looked like a walnut that year. I was that shredded. But it came at a cost mentally. Not, not so much with my depression, but I couldn't... I got to one stage where I went to get fish and chips for my kids on holiday. We were, I went on holiday and dieted on holiday and I wouldn't touch the paper because it had fat on. And I remember saying that. I, I'm not picking that up. It's got fat on it. Because I, in my head, even though I'm reasonably intelligent, and I know that fat will not get through my fingertips into my love handles. I refuse to touch the, you know, the, the paper that yeah, the fish yeah, had been wrapped yeah. in. I wouldn't pick it up. And I just remember thinking, what, what have I done to myself here? And that's, that's how strict it was. That's pretty powerful, yeah, that, John, yeah, really, yeah. To, to hear that to, for, for somebody like yourself. But like yourself, you're not, you know, it's not like you've got no idea about things. I study nutrition, it, and affects, I know it's impossible, but yeah, still... Yeah, but how, it affect, you, how it can affect you mentally to what yeah, you think. You, that, that's you're not crazy, rational. That. And listen to John, who, like I said, he's, he's, he knows his stuff, but can you imagine all the bro scientists in that world, who, the amount of crap that must flow around that yeah, yeah. That, in that environment, those, that kind of neurotic, narcissistic mindset of, of what it takes to be on stage yeah. without that, that education. Oh, I can't well, imagine... That, 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 the dehydration side of it. So I, we all know about that guy on that about rice cake and fish that sort uh, that documentary i did a my second year i competed and i decided because i didn't know what i was doing back then i I'd dehydrate two days out so all i drink is sips of water and the night before i drink wine and i remember trying to get pumped up backstage wasn't happening and i remember because it's quite hard i know a lot a lot of people think it's a beauty contest for big men but you're actually tensing you're isometrically contracting your muscles for anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes. So it's quite hard. And I remember going dizzy on stage and thinking, I don't think I'm going to be able to walk. If I get asked to come forwards and one of the judges spotted me going a little bit dizzy and handed me a bottle of water and instantly I drank this water, I felt better. And after that, I thought, I'm never doing that again. What a stupid idea. 
dehydrate in two days before a competition. Boxers do it all the time, don't they? They yeah. try and make him wait and things like that. And it's just not a healthy state to be in. So quite a lot of people think they've got water retention when in fact it's cake retention. So <laughs> I've got that. Restrict I've got that. Yeah. Restricting your water is, and I never did it again. And I got a much better, um, my coach at the time, me and Duckett used to say, drink, if you go to the toilet and have a wee, you just replace that amount. So you, you keep that wee flowing. If you go two hours without a wee, you need to drink a bit more. And that, that was a much healthier, you know, last two days rather than not drinking for two days and then drinking wine. Yeah, that is a bit, that is a bit crazy, isn't it? I know I have heard you doing stories yeah, well, yeah. about people collapsing and stuff don't you, after it. But... It's, it's bizarre, yeah. that, John. You know, like, because bodybuilding side of things, I've never... I mean, I've seen stuff and I know roughly, you know, like, but to hear you talk about it like that as such i mean it's a i think for a lot of people i think it's a proper eye opener to what you know to what it's all about but that obsession with with the fat thing i can't yeah. i can't get over that but it's questioning that, that i've never thought that before myself about eating fish i've never thought that it could get <laughs> maybe i'm <laughs> done <laughs> you're too busy with your paper i'm sucking fat out of paper because there's a bit of butter on there don't waste that butter yeah. Um, John, what, what body fat percentage were you down to when you're talking of things like that to be that shredded to, to what are you down at there? I've never I never got it tested for whatever reason. I don't know. Single digits definitely, but you've got to be in single six or seven, way. maybe. I don't know. I never got it I never got it officially because every test you do, as Mark knows, if you do a bioimpedance test, it's different. I remember going before a competition, I actually had uh, veins on my abs. I was that lean. And I went to Asda to get my uh, wine for the show. And they had some students in there from the local gym, actually, you know, with the handheld uh, electronic bio yeah, yeah, the, 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 the scale thing. We've got and uh, they said, oh, yeah, they were just the, the handheld ones. And they said, oh, would you like to have a go on this? I said, go on then. And I think I came out at 13%. And they went, oh, that's very healthy. And I was, I remember feeling incredulous. I was like, I can't be 13%. I've got abs with veins on. And I remember <laughs> doing the shirt in Asda. Look at that. That is not 13% body fat. Oh, I've got you've done something for the bees. I've done that. Yeah. How yeah. dare you? You're talking a very low. We, we yeah. only know from a consistent, not weight, like I said, we do, we, I won't say we know as body fat accurately. All we know is like from a, consistent point of view we've used this tanita scales for a good few years so we we only know we've got a baseline of where we probably are most of the year and we go up and down a little bit it varies yeah yeah whether it's actually accurate but we're almost about 14 15 generally i think as athletes if you can be 14 or below 12 12 was like where i felt comfortable roughly it's like on my body weight i went off i used to compete about 83 kg and i'm six foot tall and one year I got to 79 uh, for a competition abroad. And I remember I had to go and uh, power walk in the sun in Belgium in the bin bag to try and get under 80 oh my God. just to sweat it off. But I used to compete 83, but I feel more comfortable at 88. I can get in my 32 jeans. Is I can have a pint. Talking, talking I'm about, about 90. But now I'm probably about 90, between 90 and 91, but I, pref I feel more comfortable about between 88 and 90. Right. Cool. Um, next question, okay. can I ask you, I'd, I'd like to know a little bit more about where, why you got into your personal training then. What, you know, like after, so you did your S&C, where, what made you think I'm going to start training, but instead of athletes, why did you start training people like us now? I think, I don't know, because when, when I was playing rugby, I was always in the gym more than I was on the field. I preferred, because when I played rugby, I was in the second team. So when you play rugby union and you're a second team player in the forwards, my job was standing on the scrum machine for the forwards in the first team. So I'd turn up to rugby training. We'd all play tick and pass in a warm-up back then. And then it'd be right, backs and forwards split. Second team, you stand on the back of the scrum machine. The first team would be practicing scrummaging. And I think, it's a, what a waste of my evening. I'd rather be in the gym. So I started going to the gym, and then some of the lads would say, can you write me a program? Can you do this? Can you do this? And then when my wife got a new job, 
earning more money. She said, because she, she knew I was unhappy at insurance. If you're going to change your job, now is the time to do it. Because gym work, as you know, if you've ever worked in the gym, is so badly paid. So I dropped I do, uh, half my wage going from insurance to working in the gym. Uh, so I worked as a gym instructor. Then I got in the s &C. When When my cast contract finished full time, I just thought there's no security in this at all. There's, like say Mark will know, chasing that full-time job in rugby league, it's very, if your face fits or if you have a certain, if you've been a player of a certain standard, whereas I hadn't. So I thought I need more regular money. That's where I got more into the PT side of it. And it was just growing back then as well in the early 2000s. When I started at David Lloyd's in 98, I think there were two PTs and now there's probably 20. Yeah. Times gone, the times, yeah. It's just, it's just kind of normal now, isn't it? Everyone, because gyms are run by PTs now, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Whereas back in 98, when I was a level two fitness instructor, we had two PTs at David Lloyd's, male and female. And wow. they were killing it. Yeah, that just shows, doesn't it, how it's gone through real fast. It's crazy. All your gyms now, it's just it's just a run-of-the-mill thing, isn't it? Yeah, I've got a, you just speak nearly everybody you speak to, yeah. Got and that's just at the gyms, all the, all the online stuff. The gym, the online. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. Well, you get online PTs who've never been a PT in a gym. That's what really... Uh, I'm trying not to swear. I know you've said you can swear, but it grinds my gears when someone sets themselves up as an online PT and they've never actually PT'd anyone face to face. They've never actually coached. Yeah. And, and, and it's full of them. The world is full of them because I think it's an easy ride, don't they? They get the, they get yeah, the yeah. level three PT, which is a piece of piss. I'll swear yeah. that. It's a, it's, a, it's a joke of a qualification, let's be honest. It's done in six weeks, probably, on average. You know nothing, really. It's like the start of the knowledge in it. You, you, you're very, very under knowledge to go out in the big wide world and the, and I think they just think it's an easy ride. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to be an online yeah. PT. I'm going to have that. because they can just sit at home, be a keyboard warrior and send out, they just think I can send out loads of training programmes. Yeah. So you bang on, it's exactly. ridiculous. Yeah. I saw yeah. a post last week, one day, or it might have been a couple of weeks ago now on Facebook. I can't remember what company it was, I'm naming name. And it was, no qualifications needed, no experience needed, become a level three personal trainer in 16 days. Yeah. What is that saying about the industry? Not great, you is can't, it? You can't even do 10 press-ups, but you can become a PT. Exactly, yeah, that's the problem. And when you're online, nobody knows who you are. You could make yourself look amazing no. from behind the camera, couldn't you? You could have a really good profile picture of somebody else. It's just all bull. It's just all other. That's, that's the world, isn't it? That's yeah. the world we live in. Yeah. yeah, John isn't that. And uh, in the process of not being that, he's yeah. got five lessons yeah. learned from a career health and fitness. Oh, yeah. I forgot what we're talking what about. Way that was. Unbelievable. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that's the level. You, are, you are definitely, I saw a bit of Top Gear last night. You are definitely that. We're, uh, we're one version of, of Paddy <laughs> and Freddy. I don't know what we are, but. I thought you were going to say Jeremy Clarkson. What, 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 I don't know what that is. Yeah. Oh, well, you're you can't remember the name of yeah, that person. Yeah, no, well, that's it. I can't even remember his name. <laughs> We were getting out of the car and he was saying so. I thought that is hell. <laughs> That's hell. <laughs> you might have seen that. I don't know who it is. I, I forgot his name now. I went blank. I think it's called. Is that memorable? Come yeah. on, John. It is because this was the top. This was yeah. the yeah. time. This was the topic. Top yeah. top. We've got about eight minutes left. Yeah. So uh, what I did because I did a bit of prep because I don't like being uh, put on the. But you see what you did there. You prepped. Yeah. yeah. I prepped. So. I've got one lesson that I learned for mental health, which is what we mentioned, but I could talk all day about that. One from nutrition and then three from training, if that's all right. Yeah, perfect. And what I've not come up with these myself. I just follow certain people, for people's books that I've read, people that I follow, been to their workshops and seminars. So the mental health side of it, when I was suffering from depression a few years back, I think it was Gaz Carvel actually recommended this book to me not name dropping my famous friends, but uh, Steve Peters, Professor Steve Peters, Chimp Paradox. I don't know if you've yeah. read it. Yeah. Uh, and when I read that book, it was like, I don't know, it's a cliche light bulb moment, but having that chimp in your head that overpowers, as you know, with what I've just said about the fat and the fish and chips, that was my chimp brain. The chimp side of my brain was so kind of obsessed by getting lean. And that's, that side of things 
affected my life in a lot more ways than others. So from a health perspective, I was fit and healthy physically, apart from my injuries, but mentally, no matter how I looked or how many competitions I won, I still had really low self-esteem, thought I wasn't worth anything. Uh, I've never contemplated suicide, but I can understand why people do, because I, I literally said to my wife one day, I don't think you'd notice if I didn't come home, you and the kids. And that was when she said, you need to go to get some help. I think you're depressed. So I went to get counselling from Turning Point. Work was very helpful at the time when I was in Doncaster College and someone recommended this book. And it, it really helped me, to be honest. And I've, I've lent that book to numerous people and recommended it. My copy now is out with someone else. Uh, so that's mental health lesson. I'll move on because I could talk about that all day. Nutrition, you can't outrun your fork or you can't outtrain your fork, which bodybuilding wise. So I think under the age of 25, you possibly can. Uh, under the age of 25, you can eat what you want and still have a six pack and be fit and healthy. But once you get 25, 30 and onwards, you really need to watch what you're eating, I think. And I've learned my physique transformed literally in that first competition in 12 weeks. I never had abs in 33 years. And I didn't train much harder than I had before, but I just stopped eating all the rubbish. And I got more regimented and I got looking at what protein I put in, looking how much water I drank each day, eating uh, single ingredient foods, which is one of the lessons that I learned from Phil Learney on one of his podcasts years ago. Single ingredient foods rather than when you look at a label and it's got 10 things in it. If it's got one ingredient, it's probably going to be a lot healthier. So that's lesson two. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes that's sense. Cool. Yeah. And then training wise, uh, one size fits nobody. I think it, I can't remember if it was Mike Boyle or Dan John who I read that article. And I did a talk about it when I went into one of the university talks. Rather than one size fits all, which is what a lot of your PTs give you, you know, your program, beginner's program, do that, or one size fits nobody. So you've got to kind of tailor everything you do. So the, you know, the truth pendulum, I think Mark used to talk about it in our lessons. You've got zero carbs on one side of the pendulum, 80% carbs on the other side. The truth is somewhere in between the two. Some people sit on one side of the pendulum, some people sit on the other, but it's not one or the other. It's not everyone must go ketogenic, which is what a lot of these people say, don't they? Ketogenic is the way to live. Some people it might be, some people it isn't. So that's what I've learned in my PT and myself. I do quite well on low carbs, whereas other people are horrible on low carbs. So you've got to try and find where they sit on that pendulum. Uh, number four is when I learned about the, you know, the, there's different lists, isn't there, about your basic human movements, hinge, squat, carry, push, pull, uh, single leg work, which is, I know, Mark, you did your... Is it your PhD on single leg work? Did, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's been, especially as I got older, I know, I've, and Mike Boyle was one of the people who got slated for saying, don't do as many back squats, try and do the single leg squats. And since I started doing single leg squats, my knees have been better. My leg, actually, I feel my leg development is better. I'm not putting as much strength in my back because when I deadlifted and squatted heavy, I, my back used to go before. <laughs> anything else. I mean, I couldn't lift every for about three weeks because my back had gone. Whereas now I'm doing my single leg stuff and I'm trying to make sure each week I hit those main movements. They don't have to all be in one workout uh, and loaded carries and things like that. I never used to do that until I did a few, bit of strongman training. Can so I, that's... Is that, is that how you train for your bodybuilding shows? Or did you do the traditional isolation type lifts for your bodybuilding stuff? A bit of both, which leads on to the next, another good segue that leads on to the next one, which was put the big rocks in first. So that, that analogy we've used before, haven't we, where you've got a bucket and you put the big rocks in, then you put the small rocks in, then you put the sand in and you say, is it full? And then you eventually put water in. So that's what I try and do in my training and with my clients. The big rocks would be your compound lifts. You know, you deadlift, squat, press, row, whatever it is. Or you, if, if you're athletic, it might be your cleans or some sprints and things, some jumps. Uh, then you've got the more 
bodybuilding type lifts. Then you've got your isolation lifts and then you've got your stretching and your core. So I try to use that philosophy with my bodybuilding. I was a lot more athletic in bodybuilding than I was than a lot of other people. It's probably why I have. My physique was a lot more athletic looking than some others. You know, I was only on stage 83 kg. What's that? Just over 13 stone. Yeah, yeah. So I'd like to think, you know, if if I, I could still have a game of touch rugby or I could still play five a side with my son or well, some bodybuilders struggle to walk because they live and breathe non-functional movements. Whereas I didn't. I tried to be that's why I'm another time I met Mark in the weightlifting club. Yeah. I joined the Wakefield Weightlifting Club because I thought if I want to learn how to do a lift, that's usually my philosophy. If I want to learn something to do it, I put myself in the spotlight and I entered two weightlifting competitions and I came last in both of them. But I only did it because uh, the pressure of being in a competition made me turn up every week to a weightlifting club yeah. to get my technique, technique right. I wish I'd learned that sooner. That's number, lesson number six. I wish I'd start Olympic weightlifting in my twenties, not my thirties and forties. Yeah, I, th- I think what you all the things that you've said there. I mean, in a lot of ways, this is we could have a podcast itself discussing some of the stuff that yeah. that you've talked about there, mate. Do you know what I mean? Like, because um, your five lessons are big, you know. But the like how we train people, we do look at all that same things. Like you say, your hinge, your squat, your pulls, your pushes. That's how that's how we train, and like you say, you you get them lifts in first, and if you've got time, and if the, you know, for all else, and you add the extras in, don't you? You 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 can add extra exercises in then on top of it. Yeah, um, I had a I had a discussion with Mark years ago when we were teaching about bicep curls, and he was saying, you know, I don't know if you remember it, Mark. Waste of time, bicep curls. Well, and I think I found a picture of Usain Bolt. I think it was doing bicep curls, and I'm like, look, even Usain Bolt is a sprinter does bicep curls. Yeah, hey, especially you know for you know yeah. for bodybuilder, it's essential. I don't, I don't do bicep. I, we were on about this the other day. I've, I've hardly ever trained my arms in my in my life because number <laughs> one, it's it's, it's <laughs> it, it actually bores me when I go on to to do a little bit of ends. I just think, oh, I've had enough now. It, it bores me. Does oh, does training arms? Um, I think. A lot of it's aesthetic, oh, especially for lads when they get the gun show. Yeah, and, yeah. And but what I'm going to say, what one of the thing, basketballers, an SNC coach for a basketball team, and he had them doing arms, and they were saying, from a performance point of view, it makes no difference because you're playing a sport where you're required to wear a vest. A vest, yeah. You're there, you feel the more intimidation confident. point of view. So, you know, like, if you've got somebody with big arms, then there is it. So, for confidence on the court, it would have... It, plays a factor, you know, like for their mental side of it. Did you ever feel, play against their arms feel good? Jamie Langley. Eh? Yeah. Have you do you ever play against Jamie Langley? No, I didn't, size of his arms? Yeah. And you th- you automatically if he walks towards you, you think flipping heck, look at his arms, you know, I don't want him tackling me. So oh, it's wicked. it's one of those badges of honor. There's a tank the uh, collector tank and what he's saying isn't it where his arms are absolutely huge and uh, from that you go, Christ look at that there's no Probably no more powerful than any other rugby player. No, no. His arms are massive, and you go, Jesus, look at the size of him. <laughs> a lot of it is genetic, though. I think I do yeah, think not, certain yeah. body parts are genetics, like calves, for instance. I've yeah, been are, plagued with skinny are. calves, but some people I know don't do any weights at all on their calves, and they're massive, like big yeah. steak puddings. Uh, so very good. Mate. I thought they were great, yeah. great five tips. Yeah, they to, are. For, like I said, they, they definitely probably are five billies anyway. But I think all of them we could say, yeah, yeah, tick, 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 tick. So the uh, mental health really thing, good. we're probably not as you know like that. No, but we kind of chat to people. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we yeah, yeah. side of things that we get people yeah. to address. If we feel like anybody's got concerns or we're, we're open to them coming to see us or with yeah, we do have people talk to us. But that yeah. one, but that one with the fat, that's unbelievable. That to be fair. Yeah, it, 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 listen, uh, that, it, that you know, just to share that, I think is. It's massive. It makes you realise that people, if someone's got an eating disorder or anything similar, and you, you try to be rational with them, and you say, "I think you look great." You know, I don't know what you're worried about. It doesn't that don't go in. No, you don't compute that. And that's you know, bodybuilders, they're all narcissists, aren't they? Really, uh, and we're all doing it for different reasons. Whether it's to boost your self-esteem or whatever. Some people have been bullied, and then they, they decide to bulk up to try and not get bullied anymore but everyone's got a different reason for it but like you say when you're obsessed by something like i was that year it's just not rational it's not healthy physically or mentally i don't think 
Well, it's got to be a balance. It's hard, mate. It's hard, that's the main thing. And now you are passing on your knowledge yeah. to everybody else, aren't you? Lecturing, so keep up the good work. You're passing on your knowledge. So I'm hoping time. a little bit of what tells them sinks, sinks in, yeah. Yeah, yeah, great. Well, we, we are just about run out of time. So, first of all, thank you very much for, for that, John. Yeah, I mean, thanks, John. Really, really great. You're uh, welcome, guys, anytime. And I'm sure our listeners will find that absolutely fascinating and hopefully I hope take so. on board some of those rules. Yeah. yeah, thanks for coming on, mate. Yeah. Great to see you. No and, uh, we'll see you all again soon. Yeah. See you thanks, walking John. the dogs, guys. See you later. See you, mate. See you, Bye. mate. Bye. See you, Mark. See you, John. Thank you for listening to today's episode. If you liked the episode, we'd like you to share with us that on YouTube. Instagram and Twitter. You can listen again on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Please leave us a rating and a review and any comments would be more than appreciated. And hopefully you'll tune back next time for our next episode. The Yorkshire Fitness Podcast.